you know, back at the Sermon on the Mount, where he said, you've heard it said, love your neighbors, but hate your enemies. But I say, hey, you love your enemies. And what an idea that is, a concept that is. We, we've been talking through, like, how do we do that? Well, today what we want to do is we want to kind of take a, a, a different turn. We want to kind of go in a different direction, but it kind of fits together. It's purposeful. And it's purposeful because we know that we live in a culture today that while we are out there trying to love our neighbors, trying to love our enemies, that we also know that temptation is in every turn. That the opportunity for the pull to compromise is everywhere. And no matter who you are, no matter how strong of a Christian you are, there's always that situation, there's always that opportunity, there's always that, that magnetic pull to take us away from God's plan and to get us to fall into the trap of running after, remember this last week, of that evil world. Remember? That we are pulled in that direction. And there's no better passage in Scripture that gives us a, a clear picture of what it means to live in a culture, in a world that is drastically running from God, staying away from God, staying away from truth, of how to live in that culture, how to be successful in that culture, how to be a leader in that culture, but also how to never compromise our belief, to always stand on doctrine. And so today, that's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to focus on. In Daniel chapter 1, I'm going to read this passage to you today, and then we're going to just spend a little bit of time kind of learning from exactly what it is that we can kind of grab a hold of out of Daniel chapter 1 that gives us, like, takeaways for every single one of us. Because make no mistake that, that what Daniel was put into, and we're going to read this in a minute, but the, the situation that Daniel was put into uh, back around 605 B.C. is exactly the same situation that we're in every single day of our lives, okay? Now, let me read this passage. We're going to start with Daniel chapter 1, and we're going to read the whole chapter. It's only like 20-some verses. It's not going to take long, but I want to read it because, again, context is everything as we begin to learn how to live without compromise in a compromising world, okay? So Daniel chapter 1, let's begin with the verse, verse first. In the third year... Of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand, which some of the articles, with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, or the land of Shinar, just so you know, it's the land of Babylon, which is modern day Iraq. He carried them into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed uh, Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Now, make sure you understand verse 3, when it says that he was instructed to bring some of the children of the leaders, of the nobles, of royalty, uh, in the house of Judah, in the land of Judah. What that really means is to go and to capture them, take them into captivity. That's what took place here. Verse 4, young men in whom there was no... Uh, no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand. That means they were very smart, very bright, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, in whom they may teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave these names. They changed their names. They gave them Babylonian names. And here are the names they gave them. To Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. So now, you know who we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks, right? So we're talking about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now we're kind of getting back into, oh, I know them from Sunday school. So we got that's what we're going to be focusing on talking about. Let's keep reading verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. You have to underline that verse in your Bible. With the portion of the king's delicacies, not with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into the favor of the goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test 
test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies, and as you see fit, then deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them for ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Now, verses uh, 15 and 16 are important. Because what that tells us is this. If you spend all your time eating only vegetables, it is true that you can be fatter than if you eat nothing but junk food and meat. <laughs> That's what it, God's word, people. God's word. All right, let's keep reading. Just put that in my notes. Just, just, just a little side thing here. Okay, verse 17. Uh, As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said that they, uh, said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers who were in all of this realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, let me just set the stage here just quickly what happened, right? You, you all got it, right? So, uh, so after Nebuchadnezzar went down and he defeated the king of Egypt, uh, then he actually moved up and he went up and he began fighting against Judah. And it says here, verse 2, that, that, that he, you know, besieged Judah. He actually, you know, took over Jehoiakim and all the people of Judah. They took the stuff out of the temple. They took it back to Babylon, modern-day Iraq. They kidnapped, they captured some of the kids, some of the young people. And by the way, just so you know, the ages of the kids, uh, the, the historical context of what they did back in those days tells us that they, they began to, in fact, Plato, I think, actually talked about this, that in the Babylonian culture, that they began the education process of young men at about 13 to 14 years of age. So Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were about 13 or 14 years old. They were taken away from their homes, taken away from their families, taken away from their homeland, and they were taken all the way over to Babylon, over to modern-day Iraq. They were taken into the king's castle, into his palace, and there they were instructed that you're going to eat this way, you're going to drink this way, you're going to go to class, you're going to learn, because the purpose was to brainwash them into, because they took only the best, remember we read that, only the best that they took of Judah, and brainwashed them so that then they would actually be servants to the king and would actually be people that they could be training up as the leaders going forward. Daniel was one of them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were, there were three of them as well. And there, in that context of that story, Daniel said, purposed in his heart, that he would not defile himself. What that says is this, Daniel decided he was not going to compromise what he believed. Daniel said, there's no way that I'm going to become what they want me to become. I'm going to stand for truth. Now that's a great statement that all of us today, that we need to kind of grab a hold of. Because let's be honest, in today's culture, that same pull is on every single one of us. To pull us away from truth, to pull us away from God's word, it's at every turn. I mean, you go to the media today, you watch the videos, television, you read books, you read the newspaper, you see the news. Everything is trying to get us to believe a new narrative, a new truth. That what was true yesterday is no longer true today. That everything is changing and so therefore we need to change how we act and what we believe based on what the culture is doing and acting and believing. And so we're all in the same boat here, right? Now, now we weren't kidnapped, we weren't taken out of our homes, we weren't taken to the king's palace to, to be brainwashed. No, that's not happening. But make no mistake, we're in the exact same situation that Daniel found himself in that many years ago. Now, in light of that, recognizing that truth, let's try to find some takeaways that we can grab hold of here. Some things that we can kind of use to, to teach us and to help us, to guide us so that we will be like Daniel. Because what does it say? In this story, very clearly, Daniel, man, he, he stood his ground, and God blessed him for it. And I think all of us would like to be in that same boat, wouldn't we? We all like to be in that same place, so we did not compromise, and as a result, God blessed. Okay, some things that we need to kind of recognize and take away from this passage that we can understand that, that can be real and, and, and valid and, 
and relevant for our journeys today. The first thing is this. Sometimes we have to understand this. Sometimes God allows the enemy to have a victory. Sometimes God allows the enemy to have a victory. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever sit back and wonder why does it seem like the enemy is always winning in today's culture? But like, why is it that the things that we know are bad, the things that we know are wrong, the things that we know run counter to God's word, like why is that now becoming the norm? Why is that being accepted? Why is that being promoted in our culture today? Okay, the same thing happened back then. Sometimes we have to recognize, sometimes God allows the enemy to have a victory. Look what it says in this passage in verses one and two. Third year, the reign of Jehoiakim. And just know, Jehoiakim was not the natural leader. He was not the one that should have been king. In fact, it tells us that the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, actually dethroned the, the son of Josiah, who should have been and would have been king for the rest of his life. He actually dethroned him, and he put Jehoiakim in as the king. So in other words, the king of Judah... The, the, the king of, of the people of God was already an illegitimate king. So God had already allowed a victory to take place by the enemy, even in the house of Judah. And so